So that's the number for the OTN service desk. Um, and they'll be in the best position to help you with anything you need today as far as technology. The handouts, if you don't already have handouts for today's session, please go to this website that you see up on the screen. Many of you are very well trained going to that site, so hopefully you have your handouts today, which is a PDF of the PowerPoint handout. As well, uh, we uploaded the cases. There are two cases you'll see today. So for easy reference, we put up a Word document for you uh, to keep with, uh, with your group as you analyze in your room, in your video conference room. And uh, now we'll start. I'm just going to go through some laundry items. We are recording today's event. Uh, so I'll begin with a few laundry items, and we will get to the questionnaire during that, those laundry items. So I'll just take this down for now. Okay. All right. Um, I'll be back in about 10 seconds, so talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> And I'm back. Okay, so again, my name is Roseanne Stein, and I am the Knowledge Exchange Coordinator for the North Community Network of Specialized Care. Our lead agency for the North Network is handsthefamilyhelpnetwork.ca. The education event that you're participating in today is hosted by the Community Networks of Specialized Care, or as you've come to know, the CNSC. I'd like to welcome participants today who are coming in on different types of technology today. Of course, the video conference sites. Uh, we have people as well watching via live webcast. And we're seeing more people now connecting using vi personal video conferencing. So there's, there are quite a few people at their computers today watching. So congratulations uh, for setting up your accounts. More and more people now are going to be coming into events using a personal video conferencing. So Sarah Battleventure from OTN mentioned we have about 55 sites connected today. Thank you, everyone, for making the effort to come out today and for using online registration where you did access the online package. It's the first time we've been using this for such a large event, and we're hoping to use online registration, which is easier for you, easier for collecting data on events as well. Uh, so amongst the different organizations connecting today, we have many community living organizations. Uh, we also have some mental health and a couple from the health sector. So that's great to see. The topic today, as I mentioned before, is palliative or end-of-life care and people with developmental disabilities. This is a collaborative e event of the four regions of the Community Networks of Specialized Care. And it is the third event that we're running in this way, where we bring in panelists from across the four regions. So on behalf of the audience today and my colleagues from across the province, I would like to uh, welcome our distinguished panel from the four regions of the network. And thank you for your valuable uh, contributions of time and expertise. It's been a pleasure uh, really developing this with everybody. And thank you also to Pete Fowler and Tony Goujon. So the online package is really the, the uh, trying this out is the brainchild of Tony Goujon. So thanks, Tony, for your efforts uh, in making this happen. And uh, of course, Pete has been uh, so um, helpful uh, with the troubleshooting of technology throughout and getting things going so it can happen today. Uh, the case history-based learning format and panel discussion provides a great opportunity for organizations to learn and share knowledge with presenters and peers across the province, and you're going to see some of that today. The session format uh, will include panelists guiding you through a presentation of approximately two hours. 
And uh, it's on a topic uh, that allows for didactic and case-based learning. The PowerPoint slides and case studies, as I mentioned, were uploaded to the CNSC website. Use these to uh, refer to content and cases throughout the session. Once we do complete the session, we'll open up the floor to question and answer. And please take your breaks as necessary. For those watching via live webcast, of course, it doesn't seem very interactive. However, there is an inter interactive feature called Ask a Question, and we have enabled it for today's session. So those on your computers watching the webcast, different from the personal video conferencing, which is highly interactive, like the video conference site, uh, webcast allows you to send in a question, and in that way you can interact. So my email address is connected to the webcast today. You can click on, um, I think it looks like a talking bubble, and it will immediately populate an email, and you can send a comment about the case when we're at that point, or a question, and we'll find a time to pass your question along to the panelists. For session feedback, I'm just going to put up the slide. Uh, oh, wait a minute, it's earlier. Here we are. Session feedback, we would like to get some more session feedback. We're not handing out papers anymore. Uh, it's much easier for us and much easier for you if you could use your smart device, computer, tablet, phones, iPads, whatever you have. And please, if you don't have it with you and it's nearby, get it. <laughs> we strongly recommend. <laughs> and uh, we would like you to bring those in because on your handout you have a QR code which you can uh, use to access the SurveyMonkey questionnaire. And you can easily give us your feedback uh, using that QR code. Um, you can use the link, the SurveyMonkey link you see on that page. And as well, Tony, uh, I know we'll be putting up uh, the survey access uh, link on our website. But this is the best thing to use. So we'll give some time at the end of the session, and we, we really... Um, ask you to take a, just a couple of moments to fill out a very short questionnaire so that we can uh, see what you would like in the future in, in terms of not just topics but how we can improve upon these sessions okay so we'll do that again at the end privacy and confidentiality just as a reminder uh, as you formulate questions and raise issues please adhere to privacy and confidentiality guidelines in accordance with the Personal Health Information Protection Act. This session is not intended to offer consultation for given individuals, but rather it's intended as an educational opportunity. Uh, with the flyer that you received were the biographies of the panelists, so we're not going to go through biographies this morning. We'll save more time for the actual presentation. And instead, I'm going to ask presenters to just briefly introduce themselves as we move directly into the presentation. And Nicole Babette will be um, the, the last person to introduce herself with learning objectives to take us into the event. So we'll start with Dr. Stephen Kelleher. And if you could just move on uh, Stephen, you'll go to Mark Poling after that. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Stephen Kelleher. I'm a family physician with a focused practice in palliative care in Kitchener-Waterloo, and I'm in my seventh year of practice. So, uh, hi, everyone. I'm Mark Poling. I am uh, the palliative pain and symptom management consultant for Northwestern Ontario. Um, I've been a little bit longer than seven years. Um, my focus has been in palliative care for 25 or 30 of my 43 years as a nurse. Um, I hold a nurse practitioner certificate, uh, and I work solely now in um, hospice palliative care cross-sector. And I'm Tricia Murphy. Um, I've been in the developmental services field for about four years now. Uh, I spent those four years with Community Living Thunder Bay. Um, and three of those four years, I've worked with frontline support staff around supporting people with palliative care in their homes. Um, I'm Cindy Chassis. I'm very flattered to be on the panel. I'm the healthcare facilitator for the Southern Network of Specialized Care, or rather, I'm one of them. Um, my region is from Woodstock to Windsor to Tobermory. So 
I have also been in the developmental services field for about eight years, and I would say the majority of that experience involved um, palliative care for people that we supported in varying degrees over the course of the entire time. So I thank you very much and welcome to everyone. Hello there, I'm Jen Sibilati and I'm a physiotherapist. And I'm Nicole Bobet, I'm an occupational therapist. And we represent a small rehab team um, that uh, works out of Kingston, Ontario. We're at Onguanada, which is an agency that supports adults with developmental disabilities. Okay, so I'm going to uh, start this morning off with just explaining it uh, and going over a couple of our learning objectives. So by the end of today's session, we hope uh, that you will be able to define the philosophy underlying the palliative approach as it applies to caring for people with a life-limiting illness. Two, name some of the challenges facing people with a developmental disability receiving palliative care services in different types of living environments. Three, describe using a holistic approach how to provide the best support to something nearing the end of life and really looking at describing the caregiver's role throughout the stages of palliative care. And then four, identify people who could be part of the palliative care team, including key community partnerships, roles, and responsibilities. I'm gonna pass it over to Marg now to, uh, to jump into the presentation. Thanks so much. So we're going to start off by looking um, at objectives one and four together because they seem to fit best <clears throat> in that way. So um, what I really, what we're really, really talking about here is the palliative approach to chronic disease management and that is um, um, the reason that uh, we're here today to talk about how that works in the world of developmental disabilities. So you'll see through my slides a, a lot of um, um, quotes and, and a lot of the reasons that I have become so um, passionate about the field, the, the world, the community of developmental disabilities is because of some of the interactions and, and um, uh, sessions that I've attended. And Lee, Lee Keegan and Carol Ann Dirk um, um, were people that, a uh, presentation that I saw, and this actual uh, quote was what really made me think that we really needed to talk about um, palliative care and dying in the world of, of de developmental disabilities because the greatest human freedom is to live and die according to one's own desires and wishes and in the place that you really um, want that to have happen. So that's why we need this presentation. Um, we, we talk about the fact that people with developmental disabilities um, are living a lot longer, they're aging. There was a time when um, people with developmental disabilities, um, such as Down syndrome, had a much shorter life expectancy than, than the general public had. But now we know for a fact that people with developmental disabilities, that life expectancy is within five years of, of a person without a disability. Um, we know that people with developmental disabilities face some really unique barriers to end-of-life care choices. Um, Twenty years ago when I was um, working in, in the community, um, a young lady with Down syndrome wished to no more interventions um, for her congestive heart failure. She was very end stage and wished to return home to her group home. And that was not, we were not able to do that for her. We had to look at an alternative of a hospice unit um, and things happened very nicely, but she the, the possibility of her making her wishes known um, to die where she lived, uh, we couldn't make happen for her. So it became very much um, what I needed to do to work towards having that happen and, and luckily, nicely, it has. So um, this quote is not mine at the end, but, but uh, again, people um, with developmental disabilities and who work with people with developmental disabilities help to plan their lives, help to make their lives quality and help to have them live where independently and where they w wish to live. So if we do that, why would we not help people plan around um, the end of their life and knowing that, that they have choices that they should be able to make? 
Now, part of, of um, what I do in my consultant role is really talk about what hospice palliative care really is. And that was how we started the discussions in the group home settings and with people with developmental disabilities, um, by defining hospice palliative care. It's very much um, misunderstood sometimes and, and taken to mean palliative means end of life, which um, people would really think of someone actively dying. And so to say you would benefit from a palliative approach really took some people aback. And, and uh, people with developmental disabilities um, were very much aligned with that as well. Um, so we, we really had to make a point that Hospice palliative care is really not about dying. It's about living with good quality of life and, and good quality of death as well. So hospice palliative care really does look at that whole person and their family and look at all of their needs, the physical, psychosocial, um, uh, psychological, spiritual, and, and all the practical issues that are, are associated with that talks about hopes and expectations and what their fears are. So it really is looking at that whole person and, and getting an idea of who that person is, where they're coming from, and, and what their wishes are. A little later on we'll see a graph that's really quite busy, but really it talks about the, the whole spectrum of hospice palliative care, and it goes right from diagnosis right through to grief and bereavement, and talking about how you support families and the people that are left behind as well. Hospice palliative care is very much an active care. We look at very active issues and preventing new issues um, from occurring and talking about um, using different um, modalities and all the members of the team uh, in managing all of those issues. So just a few facts that, and, and why we really um, people would benefit from a palliative approach to their chronic disease management. Um, and and the, slides, the statistics are there on the screen. So in 2007 alone, 37% of Canadians um, reported that they had been diagnosed with one chronic condition or illness. Um, and you'll see the, the citation for this, the Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association fact sheet. It's a very, very informative website if you wish to go, and HBCO is our Ontario um, Palliative Care uh, Association. Um, all, all of these are, facts are on their websites. Um, we do know that one in three Ontarians live with one or more chronic diseases, and people with developmental disabilities often have chronic disease processes, congestive heart failure, uh, lung disease, renal disease, um, and they, they live with that along with their disability. So um, it's really important to start talking about a palliative approach to those chronic disease management. So um, about 70% of people with chronic disease suffer from two or more. Um, we know and we've heard all kinds of, of um, things about the gray tsunami and that senior, seniors are the fastest growing age group right now and that there are, are going to be an estimated 4.6 million Canadians um, that are 65 years of age or older. And that's going to double in, in the next 25 years. Um, chronic diseases account for 70% of deaths. Um, often we hear about the people who die suddenly or tragically. Um, what really is, is fact is that um, only 2.9% of, of all deaths are sudden deaths and that most of us will die over a much longer trajectory. So, um, the palliative approach to chronic disease management um, really does, should, and we hope can start right at diagnosis when someone is diagnosed with a life-limiting or life-threatening condition. And there's new literature out that talks about serious illness. So um, I work in a lot of different sectors, as I said before, and with a lot of people, the, um, the terminology is really important, and sometimes it's much easier to talk about a serious illness and how it would benefit from a palliative approach as opposed to life-limiting or, or life-threatening. So those diseases are, are many. Congestive heart failure, Parkinson's, um, dementia, just advanced age with frailty, for instance, all would benefit from uh, a, pal a palliative approach to their, their disease management. Um, and talk about the, the expected or possible course of the disease and plan ahead. 
Um, there's all kind on those websites I mentioned before. There's all kinds of things, and we'll we'll talk about later on about advanced care planning. All reasons to um, as start a palliative approach and talk about the what ifs. What if this happens, and what if that happens? The approach will always shift and change as a person's health status changes. So it's not a one-time conversation. It's a conversation that that changes um, and should change and should um, involve different members of your team at different changes, status changes in your health. So it's talking about, again, a total individual and really respecting the right to informed consent. Um, through a palliative approach, you can really identify the straight strengths that, uh, that a person brings and the challenges that they may have with coping with that chronic illness and really talking about the transitions and, and uh, stages that lead to uh, lead the, through the disease to um, end of life. So there's been some research done and, and I've been lucky enough to participate in a lot of research in long-term care around a palliative approach and, and what a palliative approach assessment is. Um, and it talks with that, the very first thing um, is that surprise question. And it's a question that, that um, really started a lot of conversation in the world of developmental disabilities when we talked about the fact, when we asked the question, would you be surprised if the person died within the next year? Um, and so um, people then started to think about, well, we wouldn't be surprised. We wouldn't necessarily be happy, but we wouldn't be surprised that um, because he's had this many hospitalizations, or et cetera. So the, the palliative approach assessment, if you're really thinking that someone would benefit from it, going through these questions um, really does help you to focus and, and talk about are there symptoms that really need um, careful managing? What are the goals of care? What does the family understand about the disease and the prognosis and, and about the treatment options? Do they understand that this treatment um, will not necessarily work for someone with congestive heart failure. Um, have, and has anybody had those conversations uh, with them? Are there uh, a lot of social and spiritual concerns that are really, really impacting their daily life? Maybe they don't have a lot of social support. Maybe they don't have a lot of family that can help them to journey through this transition in their life. Um, have they all it, um, participated and had the conversations about the person, the individual's wishes and, and what he would like to have happen? Have you talked about resuscitation? Have they um, raised that issue themselves? <clears throat> the next slide is one that I really feel strongly in. It, it is um, probably the oldest slide, and I use it in several, several um, uh, presentations in different, reasons, different areas. Um, and it was my, a colleague of mine, Chris Sherwood, who actually uh, introduced me to this. I'm not sure if they were his original words or not either, but um, I've become very passionate about correcting people if they start to talk about um, Joe X, who's palliative, or the palliative patient down the hall. People are not palliative. Uh, the care that they would benefit is, is palliative care. Um, if, if, we, if we term people as palliative in that case, we're all palliative because we're all born and we're all going to die. So um, it's a care, it's a philosophy, it's an approach to care, not a person. The next slide is the busy slide that I had mentioned before um, about the different um, stages of palliative care, and, and this slide has gone through several iterations, and um, it is now part of a report called Advancing High Quality, High Value Palliative Care in Ontario, um, and it's the model that has really driven the palliative approach to chronic disease management. Um, it talks about the different stages. It talks about how that fits along the timeline that, that is of someone's journey um, when they have, are diagnosed with a chronic disease. It's very busy, and you probably can't see it very well, but in, in your handout, you can uh, look through it. And you can also see it in the, that document that is cited below. Um, but it talks about whole person care. It talks about um, the fact that you may need more of a um, treatment approach and, and less of a palliative approach at different times, and it will vary with the course of your illness. Uh, and, and I think it's an excellent um, um, move forward to consider all of those aspects of palliative care right through to grief and bereavement. The next slide, um, I talk about um, a, a colleague in Toronto, um, 
Christine Newman, who introduced this slide to me in the pediatric world. Um, but it, it just is a simpler, uh, a more simple, sorry, version of um, how it, it's all around the care planning. It's all around the focus and the transition. So we may have started at the beginning of the di diagnosis or the beginning of someone with a developmental disability's life and challenges, and we're talking about cure or managing all of those challenges. And then the, the focus will shift down into prolonging life and giving good quality of life. And then as things advance and, and the disease becomes more predominant, um, then the, the focus of care will change again and talk about the different transitions. I have an, a colleague who um, works in geriatrics, and he has always um, said that end-of-life care is really the terminal phase of palliative care. So palliative care starts way, way early, and we'll advance and, and move through different transitions until we come to the point that is end stage, that is end-of-life care. And then our care and focus really does shift. And throughout that, we talk about supporting and educating the family and the people who support um, the, the, the person with the, the serious illness, and then right through to bereavement care. Um, so why are we planning, and why are we talking about end-of-life care? Um, and, and I've already touched on a few of these things, because it's an, it's an ongoing activity. We all need to, to know what our philosophy around um, um, life is in general and know what we would accept and what we wouldn't accept. And at different times in our lives, um, we make different decisions. And those discussions should be ongoing so that um, well in advance of a terminal illness, we know kind of what, where we're going and what our thoughts would be. And if we can't then speak for ourselves, then we are, people are able to know what our wishes would be. Um, and it changes for a person with developmental disabilities. Um, it changes depending on what their current health status is, um, what their life experiences are. And really, the reason that we're planning, number one, is that person-centered care um, can really support someone staying where they live. Um, aging and, and allowing their disease or, or having their disease run its normal course uh, with treatment or not, um, and aging where they they live. In order to do that, we need a lot of, uh, um, a lot of help. It can't be done by one person. It needs to be done by a team. And how that team looks will depend very much on the individual and their support systems, etc. The list that you see in front of you up on the screen right now is not not an, an exhaustive list. It's huge and it's long. It doesn't mean that every single person on this list uh, needs to be a part of an individual's team, but those are the possibilities, um, and there probably are more that we've missed here. But of course, at, at the in the core center of the team is the individual and their family and caregivers. For a person with developmental disabilities and living in a group home setting, that can get a little complicated. That would mean their housemates as well as their friends and families. Uh, anybody who is impacted by uh, interactions with that individual. So the care planning needs to encompass all of those people, and thus some of the challenges that can happen for someone with a developmental disability in a group home setting. When I can't even remember what year it was that we had our first successful expected death in 2011. I think it's 2011. Um, it was it was very much a team effort. It was very much talking about um, who could be involved. Um, at that time, the team expanded to a nurse practitioner who could help the nursing staff who came in to help the, the support uh, the group home staff in dealing with the issues that were happening. Um, we have the ability to uh, incorporate a lot of different services into the group home setting now that weren't possible sometime um, previously. Um, it's really important um, to have, and the, the different members of the team can speak to the, the role of, um, uh, that they would play in that setting, but there are all kinds of people that can't necessarily, a pharmacist is extremely important. There could be um, somebody who, pet therapy is another one that's not even on there. So there are other members of the team that can speak as well. I'm thinking of our occupational therapists and our physiotherapists, if they wanted to expand a little bit on their roles in the team.
So I think from my perspective as an occupational therapist, our the philosophy of OT is very much in line with hospice, um, the palliative care approach in terms of looking at the person. So we really want to just maximize their quality of experience. So if whatever is important to them in terms of their own goals, we try to take a more proactive approach. So in terms of equipment, if we think skin may be an, an issue or equipment might be helpful to make things easier, then we would often try to, to kind of get equipment in there to make things a little bit easier for folks to continue to participate in their environments and do what they love to do. We also focus on relaxation and energy conservation. Again, education is a big piece to everybody that's important in their lives. I think um, Jen can speak a little bit more to the physio piece, but I, I think along the lines of really engaging people in what's meaningful to them. Yeah, I mean, obviously we're looking at quality of life and um, I think we're going to touch more on sort of the details later in the case studies, um, but physiotherapists often come in um, earlier on in the palliative uh, course of events in terms of maximizing the client's abilities to continue with their independent activities. Again, equipment, there is some crossover between the OT and PT roles. And then uh, later on, there's a lot of uh, involvement in terms of respi respiratory and chest physiotherapy as well um, as pain control. So I'm just wondering, too, if, if Dr. Callagher wanted to just um, say a few words around the physician role as well at this time and just uh, from his experience. Yeah, certainly I, I see myself really as part of, of that multidisciplinary team and hopefully uh, bringing uh, from the medical side uh, some expertise that way. Uh, really, uh, like everything else, uh, the, the treatment plan is going to stem from the goals of care and a lot of time at the uh, challenge is determining really what is going to be medically beneficial uh, for a particular person going forward based on their care goals, based on their uh, uh, conditions. And uh, oftentimes I'm, I'm asked to help or, or to uh, uh, declare a prognosis, which is always a very challenging thing to do, especially with these chronic diseases that can take uh, variable courses. And, uh, and, and that sort of brings back, uh, touches upon the idea of a place of care. There was mention of a, you know, a patient with congestive heart failure who, uh, who couldn't return home uh, and ended up in a hospice setting, whereas uh, that can be very challenging uh, to, uh, to know when is the right time for a hospice setting for someone with a chronic disease like that. Um, and so trying to, trying to manage in, in the home setting, not only is it patient-centered, it, it, uh, it uh, often is the important in terms of uh, uh, proper utilization of the hospice resources that are available. Exactly, thank you. Um, and what we found when we were um, really advocating for a successful expected DEFA in the group home setting um, was that the, the more people we could involve in supporting the family and decision making um, and supporting the individual themselves and the group home um, staff was was key. Um, um, it was uh, if there were feeding tube issues, uh, dietitians' involvement was key. Um, the hospice volunteer visitors were um, really great for vigiling so that the staff didn't feel that they were alone, that there was somebody that was able to talk them through the, um, the changes that were normal, natural changes um, as someone was dying, but that can be alarming for families and can be alarming for staff who, who've become very close to the individual dying in the group home setting. Um, so there are all kinds of, of um, uh, different members of the team, and one of the important things uh, uh, that we found was having the uh, palliative care coordinator at the CCAC actually um, coordinating all of that, um, seeing how what which services were necessary to help support. How do how do we make that work? How do we make it work for the other members of the uh, the housemates in in the set group home setting and. Um, how do we come together and supporting each other in the whole process and thus honoring the person's wish to die at home. 
Um, it, and it's very interesting. Uh, my role as a palliative consultant really came into play as well um, in just debriefing people around issues, around symptoms, around what was normal and what wasn't. In a lot of cases, when we have people who have never, ever seen death, who have never seen how somebody transitions. And so how do we make that a normal process and take away some of the, um, some of the angst around that? So people um, have a right to choose where they die, and that is a passion of mine. And our system's responsibility is helping, is to try and make those, if at all possible, make those choices a uh, reality. And so there are all kinds of different places that people actually do choose to die and, and do die um, a very successful, um, um, there's a lot of debate around a definition for a good death. Um, the residential hospice setting, if you happen to be lucky enough to have a residential hospice, we don't in the Northwest. Um, we do have a hospice unit uh, within a rehab hospital. But long-term care facilities are another place that people, and people with developmental disabilities often um, are in long-term care facilities as well, and it becomes their home. Um, death does happen in an acute care setting, and, and if that's the person's choice, then that, that's a fact. But home by that person's definition, should also be one of those um, choices that they can make. The, the quote that you see is, is uh, really um, the driving force behind um, normalizing death for people. Um, we really have to stop thinking about death as an incident, as, a, as an alarming incident that has to be investigated and documented and medicalized. It is the final passage of someone's life. And in order to honor that, um, we really, as a system, really need to start thinking of death as a normal in transition um, to end, end to someone's life. Our First Nations um, people have helped me with a lot of different things, and they call it the completion of the circle in a lot of cases where I'm um, presenting. They talk about the fact that death is just uh, the completion of someone's life circle. and, and um, we have the privilege of helping along with that. Um, and the D. Bright Star quote is one that I really do um, like to think that I live by. Um, and, and birth and death have often become very much uh, a similar process in my mind and my world. And I really feel strongly that life, life should indeed end as beautifully and naturally as coming into the world. And not and naturally does not mean that there are no interventions, that uh, there are no illnesses, that there are no symptoms. It's allowing the symptoms and managing the symptoms and uh, making it doable in the place of the person's choice. And I am going to pass it on to um, to Trisha to talk about the case studies and and um, I can, we can answer any questions people or comments people might have after that. Thanks, Mark. So we're going to go through some of the challenges that may specifically um, face the people we support um, and some of the supports and services around them, um, and just go through some of the the key topics and some of the hot topics that way, um, just to get your ideas going before we work into our first case study. So. We want to start by identifying what some of the key challenges are in the next slide. Um, and remembering that this can be a troubling time for not only the people we support, but their families, their friends. Um, as Mark spoke earlier, um, often when people are supported um, by the same staff for an extended period of time, could be years, could be you know 20 years, depending on how long they've been in our support, um, they have a really close bond with those people. And so we also want to take that into consideration. So challenges. Um, may arise in three key areas, and there may be others, um, but these are sort of our three big ones that um, encompass what we need to focus on. So there's going to be some personal challenges, um, be it for the person themselves, um, how it affects their life, how it affects what they do, how they spend their time. There's going to be a medical impact, um, again, with that um, life-limiting illness. How are we going to support them um, through that? What supports are needed? Um, who needs to be on that team, as we spoke earlier? Um, what role, you know, do we need support with the OT and PT? Do we need um, nursing supports at this time? What sort of thing? And knowing about that advanced care planning is how do we be proactive? Um, and environmental challenges, which is something is generally the biggest barrier we find um, supporting folks in group homes, um, is around those living arrangements, 
the physical layout of the home, the staffing resource hours, those sorts of things sometimes are what comes to be one of our big barriers. So we'll sort of break some of these down and uh, talk about what some of these sort of smaller things are. So when we look at personal challenges, it's about knowing the person and knowing how this will impact them and how they define a good life and what their priorities in life are. So when we talk about what's happening and when they say it's a specific diagnosis that's come down, um, are we explaining it to the person in a way that makes sense for them? Um, are we explaining it in a way that um, is relative to the impact on their life? So can they put it into perspective of what this really means? Um, and each person processes and learns differently, so we need to be really respectful and mindful of those things and giving them time to process those instead of expecting sort of a response right away. It gives them a chance to sort of process what their thoughts are on those things and ensure you're really soliciting some feedback from them and the folks that are around them as well. Um, another challenge we often find in this field um, is sometimes family involvement. Some of the folks that are new to our services and that are, are coming up um, aren't always the challenge, but folks that have been supportive for a really long time um, that may or may not have lived in the institution time um, we have a lot of challenge finding family involvement or close family members or really involved um, friends, people that they trust, um, people that they value their opinion um, around what's going on in their life. So sometimes that level of involvement makes things a challenge, especially if the person we support has a hard time um, expressing their wishes um, and needs a bit of support around that or isn't able to tell their story well. Um, to know sort of where they come from and things that are important. It helps to have people around them that are part of that plan to help build what makes most sense for them. And then we look at, for those involvement and relationships that are in that person's life that are very important to them, how do we support them to maintain those and, and continue to be a good son and a good friend and keep those social roles as best as they can that are important to them. Some other personal challenges that uh, we'll look at here on the next slide are other things that we need to take into consideration um, when we look at quality of life for somebody. Um, quality of life is a holistic approach when you look at um, the management of their, their illness, their life-limiting disease. Um, it's looking at their social roles in life, but it's also looking at the other things that make um, either give them purpose in life or provide them quality or solace um, that give them a reason to get up in the morning. So one of the things that um, some people are often uncomfortable around is around spiritual considerations, um, often because of, of lack of, of information or knowledge or experience. But we want to take into consideration what someone's faith or their values or their morals or their spiritual considerations are. Um, it may be um, they have a really close relationship with their faith and they're very much involved with their church. Um, they go on a regular basis and perhaps due to their illness they're not able to leave the home and go. How do we support them in ways at home that they can continue to practice their faith? Um, for some other people, they may not have had much involvement, um, but it may be important to them to have something, for example, of anointing of the sick. Um, so looking at what those are, um, even when we're talking advanced care planning, it's you know when it's all said and done, how, how do you want your life to be celebrated? Do you want a funeral? Do you want a celebration of life? Do you just do you want nothing at all? I mean, that's an entirely appropriate response as well. It's entirely person-driven. Um, we also want to look at people's life in the community. Um, someone may be very connected to the community. They may be the, every, you go with them and everybody knows them. You don't know how, but they know everybody in the city and every place you go, someone's excited to see them. And that also plays into that social role piece. So how do we keep people involved in their community to the best that we can? And it's not always really big things. It could be something simple as, um, here in Thunder Bay we have the university's hockey team. And perhaps somebody has gone every single Friday and Saturday night for as long as we can remember. They always buy a season's pass. They are so pumped to go all the time. Um, they keep up on all the news. They go to all the signings. And perhaps now with the way that their illness has progressed, they're not able to go out and do those things anymore. So how do we think creatively to not forget about that piece? To not forget about the things that bring them joy in life. And sometimes that's the easiest question to ask is what brings this person joy? And how do we find creative ways to bring that back in? Because again, as Mark talked earlier, we plan with somebody all the time in their life. And we plan for, you know, what's your big goals, what's your little goals, what do you want to do? 
And then sometimes when we become overwhelmed with this prognosis that things are moving quickly or even slowly, but that the realities hit that someone's not doing well and that there is no cure for it, and we're now in just a, a symptom management phase, we sometimes get too focused on that and we forget about keeping joy in somebody's life. So looking at how do we do creative things like that, how do we think outside the box um, and not forget about those those fun things. And then the other thing is um, what gives people a lot of purpose in life is their employment or their volunteering. So think about how this will impact their livelihood that way. How will this prognosis or this life-limiting illness affect their ability to work? Uh, will it change the hours they can work? Will it change what they're capable of doing at work? Um, when they volunteer, is it going to change the hours they need to volunteer? Are they able to do those things anymore? And knowing whether that's something that really gave them joy and purpose is how do we sort of keep something like that connected with them? And how do we keep the people that they've worked with, say, for 15 years, sort of let them know what's going on and, and help them be part of that if that's what the person wants? Is they, they look forward to, you know, Tuesday taco lunches with the coworkers every single week, and all of a sudden, you know, maybe they're not able to work anymore. Is there a way we can still go to lunch? Is there a way we can still, you know, go to so-and-so's retirement party, even though, we can't, you know, you haven't been able to work for a while? But keeping those relationships and those community connections keeps people's spirits. When we take all those things away and we just focus on care and symptom, we lose the person. It becomes just that piece of paper. It becomes that this when we don't look at the quality and that aspect of things. So we always talk about the person first, and that's why we talk about some of those personal challenges because the reason we're here, the reason we do what we do is about people. So we want to make sure we know who the person is first, and then we sort of work through how does that play into the medical challenges we're going to have? How does who the person is and what's important to them play into the, you know, the reality of the disease management that we need to look at? So often we have challenges um, with people with disabilities is really diagnosing what exactly is going on. Sometimes the people we support may not be able to exactly tell us what's wrong. Um, perhaps they have new staff around them or they're in a new environment the people don't know them well, so to know if something's different or something's changed um, may take a lot longer for people to sort of figure things out. Um, we've often seen um, how pain or discomfort presents differently um, with some people we support. So it's really about knowing that person and how do we know that something's wrong? Um, I remember working with one of my teams and they would say, oh, it's just like so-and-so, someone they had supported palliative before. And, I said, you know, the real importance is describing what you're seeing. You know, well, you know, when they do this, it's really not like them, and we think this because, and it happens at these times, to just sort of, like, find those things out. Um, sometimes, you know, it don't, trip, don't always attribute it to, oh, it's part of their disability. It's the nature of That's diagnostic overshadowing. That, you know, always be sure to check things through. But sometimes it gets really complex, and unfortunately, sometimes it takes us a while to figure out what's really going on. Another challenge we see is access to medical care, or at least access to primary care physicians in a consistent way. So not everybody we support will always have a family doctor. I mean, I just got a family doctor a little while ago, um, so I didn't have one for a while. And unfortunately, that means we often end up in the emergency room department or we end up at a walk-in when something's wrong and we're trying to figure things out. And the problem with that is you don't end up with that rapport with a doctor or rapport with your nurse practitioner or whomever it might be that builds that trusting relationship with the person supported. So when you don't have that consistent care and that consistent follow-up and that one person that's always involved, it gets a little messy sometimes. And sometimes people may interpret things differently and it, it just, it's a hard challenge. So we always try and go with that. And, and what we've been lucky for is some of the partnership we've got with CCSC is in some of those cases, we have a nurse practitioner involved through them. And that becomes our primary care physician. That becomes our primary contact, and that becomes the person that helps us keep that care really consistent. Some of the other challenges that will sort of work into our next piece is um, changing abilities and declining skills. So um, we often see this with dementia, um, where someone's physical abilities and cognitive abilities start to decline. 
And we need to really take a hard look at that sometimes is working with that person, asking those questions that if this happens, what if? And trying to plan and proactive as early as we can because that may very well affect their quality of life and it may very well affect where they live. Um, it'll affect their enjoyment of the things they do. And we really also want to look at safety. Is the person safe anymore? Um, if they live independently, can they manage their own medical care? Um, are they safe? Do they, what types of support do they need given what their change in their supports are? Um, one of the challenges I most often see, um, and again, we'll talk a little bit later, is physical mobility. So one's mobility, one's ability to do stairs or navigate their home environment on their own becomes a barrier if the home is not completely accessible. So tying that into our next one is some of the environmental challenges. Um, and this is again where I see the barrier to keeping someone in their home if that's their wish. We want to look at living arrangements. So when you look at the holistic circle of people involved in someone's life, um, family, friends, supports, um, particularly if somebody lives in a group home, you want to look at the people that are around them as well. So how is this going to impact the people they live with? How is this going to impact um, that whole process for that person? And we had a, a situation some, quite some time ago where someone was living um, at a location where someone had passed away, and he was okay with it the first time. And the second time it rolled around that somebody had moved into that home because it was physically accessible, it had the lifts, it had the hydraulic tub, it had the you know shower commode and things. And the gentleman said, you know, I'm really not okay with this. I'm really not okay in being in a home where people are always dying. And we have to respect that. We have to try and balance you know, the needs and rights of the person that is passing away, but the needs and rights of the people that we support around them as well. You know, how do we make arrangements that way? And, Again, we lucked out and had an opportunity for him to move to a different place that wasn't far away, that was with a better fit of folks around him. But we have to listen to those things too. And we have to work with the people that are around them as well. Um, how do we make this you know, a win-win for everybody? Um, do they live independently? That's a really hard one too, is if someone's lived independently all their life, and granted I would be the exact same way as, it's my home, I've lived here on my own, forever and a day, and that's how I want to live the rest of my life. And to tell somebody that that's not where they can stay anymore is a really hard thing, and especially if we're really concerned about safety. If we're concerned about someone remembering to take their medication, particularly if they have another chronic illness on top of that, say heart disease, diabetes is another one, um, that if we're really concerned about their safety and managing, we have to balance the um, dignity of risk that we all have in our lives on our rights to make, you know, we're going to eat that cheeseburger and that pop and that Sunday that day, whether it's good for our blood sugar or not, with education and promoting informed choice. We have to really be respectful that it is the person's choice and we have to sort of work through that with them. Um, it's never wise to go in and tell somebody this is what it is and you have to deal with it without working through things with people. Um, we've got to look at the physical environment. Um, again, I've had a few times where, unfortunately, someone's got lots of life left in them. But they live in a split-level duplex with stairs to go up and stairs to go down. The hallways aren't really wide enough for their walker. And it's not a home we can renovate. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate because he's lived with the people that are there for 15 years. These are his friends. Some of these are his best friends. And he just couldn't stay at home anymore. And we just really didn't have somewhere else that we could support him. And unfortunately, he ended up in... Um, what would be St. Joseph's Care Group here is um, being a rehabilitation facility and didn't even end up in the hospice care, so we ended up in a ward setting with four other people, no, three other people, and that's how he spent the last two years of his life. So we come across that challenge, and sometimes, like I said, despite our best planning and despite trying to be proactive, we do have those challenges. Um, looking at adaptive devices, that's sometimes where our win comes in. You know. Um, working with the occupational therapist, working with the physiotherapist, saying how do we keep their mobility the best we can, add in a little bit of aids that will help the person as well as the people that are supporting them to try and keep things you know, as best we can for as long as we can. And sometimes that's something simple as a hospital bed, a walker, um, lifts, um, always keeping in mind that sometimes the barrier for that is financial. Um, so looking at the adaptive devices program through um, the Ontario Disability Support Program, 
looking at what's approved and what's not, and that's working with our, our um, any healthcare providers and things. Um, and one of the really significant ones also is staffing resources support. So say the person we support is um, living in a home that's got one staff, everyone's fairly independent, and their needs change, and there's not the resource to make that two people on to help them get out of the bed in the day, and there's not the resources to make that work, or sometimes it's, is that team comfortable being part of that journey? Is that team or people on those teams willing to be part of that team where death is going to be involved? We know it's a reality for all of us, right? It's the one thing in life that's true and set, and we know it's going to happen, but are the people around them going to support them well if they're not okay with it? If we provide as much opportunity as we can for training and education, um, can we get people through the palliative care frontline workers course we have here in Center Bay? Can we give them some education on dysphagia so they're not as fearful supporting someone at a meal time? Can we exhaust all our ends that way first? But ultimately, in the end, sometimes people really aren't okay with it. And we have to look at that. We have to be respectful of that as well. Um, not everybody has that resilience or not everybody has that in them. Um, and I think it takes a strength, and we need to recognize that too, it's a strength to say I'm not okay to do this. Um, it comes from a place, and in my experience, it's always come from a place of I care about this person a lot, and I know that it's important to them to have strong people around them that are comfortable with this, and I don't want to let them down. I don't want to, I still want to be involved in some way, but I don't think I could be there at the 11th hour and, and support them well. So we need to take those things into consideration. Um, in addition to um, some environmental challenges, one of the things that is going to be prevalent through start to finish for everything is communication. We've got two more slides for that, and then we'll look at a bit of a case study. So communication skills I referred to a little bit before when we talked about um, diagnosing complex um, situations um, is really knowing the person of how they communicate and making sure that um, you're consistent with utilizing what makes most sense for them. So say the person uses a picture exchange communication type system or communication board, um, they use sign language, um, perhaps they have a, a unique way of communicating, is really respecting that. And when you go to appointments and you're sharing information with them, you make sure that um, you're respecting their type of communication and asking for help if you need it, um, asking for an interpreter if you need to. Um, we see different languages as well. So if lang um, like, um, we often support people of First Nations. So respecting that that is their, their first language, how do we support them with that? Uh, particularly um, looking at dementia, where people often go back to what their primary language was. If ang English was not their first language, we have to be mindful of that and respect those things. So trying to understand and using different tools, and I do believe some tools are, are going to be shared today around pain skills, um, how can someone indicate how much pain they're in, uh, the type of pain, how they're feeling. This is a lot of information for someone to take in a lot of the time, um, and it may take a very long time for them to really process. Um, so how do we check in with them? How do we support them to share with us how they're feeling? And again, plain language. Um, how do we help them understand? It may be something of how to explain to them what a G-tube is, what a feeding tube is, how that's going to impact their life. How does that look? And does that make sense for them? Um, and do they understand, again, what death is? Do they understand what um, dying is? Do they have anything in their life that they can relate to that? And how do we support them to understand what it is that's being shared with them and give them a chance to sort of share their thoughts back with us? So the last one for communication strategies, um, just some tips around um, how to communicate with somebody. Um, works at any point in anyone's life, but um, give time. Allow them to process. Um, don't pressure them to respond right away. Don't sort of put that um, pressure to understand. Um, and don't assume that they won't understand. Um, I think the, as much as each field has a bit of their motto, one of ours is always assume confidence. Always, always assume confidence. Um, many times over and over and over again in our field are prime examples where people haven't and then all of a sudden, you know, they have an opportunity to communicate and the things they tell us, you feel terrible as you talked around them, talked as though they don't understand. Um, don't tell them the whole story because they won't understand. 
always assume confidence and find a way to make it relative for them. Even if you have to use some sort of analogy. Or sometimes abstract doesn't work for people. So how do you do it in a way that they're going to understand? And you make sure you put that kind of effort in. Um, it may be pictures. It may be social stories. It may be videos. Um, it may be connecting them with other people that have experienced those things that might also be able to share stories so that they don't feel like they're alone that way either. But taking into consideration how they communicate, how they process and understand. Um, learning, right? Each person learns different. Do you learn by hands-on? Do you learn by reading? Do you learn by hearing? Those sorts of things um, are really important to think about. So that being said, let's look at our first case study. We've learned a little bit through Marg around some of the, the background, how we get started and why we do what we do. We've talked a little bit about um, some of the impact to the people we support. So let's look at our case study about Kathy. You'll have it here in front of you, and I'm going to read it through. Um, once I'm done reading, you guys will have about two minutes to each side to just uh, at each side to just quickly discuss um, some of your key points, some of the things um, you may have answers to the question, and we'll go around and ask sort of some feedback from everybody. So Kathy is a 31-year-old woman who, has, who is an active member in her local theater group. She shares an apartment with her boyfriend of five years. She's been battling a terminal lung disease, and the recent prognosis is that she's got three months left to live. She receives three hours a day of staff support and nurses' visits once a day. She is blind and has a developmental disability. She is struggling with her prognosis and having difficulty understanding the serious nature of her illness. She has no family to support her, and the only one involved is her boyfriend. And then we'll have some questions for you. So go to the next slide and we'll see some questions that I'd like you guys to think about. So thinking about those bits of information you know about Kathy, um, how might Kathy be supported to understand her illness and make plans? Who might be valuable to be involved in Kathy's life? And we refer to the boyfriend, but also think of that list of the palliative care support team we spoke about earlier um, when Mark was presenting as who might be valuable to have involved that might help out Kathy. And finally, what might quality of life look like for Kathy over the next three months, knowing what's important to her and what her priorities are in life. So we're going to give everybody about two minutes. Um, on my clock, I've got about two minutes after 11, so about five after. I'll call on a couple of places and see who might get one to get started.
right, folks, so at each of the sites we've had some time to do some quick discussion. I know it's not a lot of time, but you'll have another case study to really sort of utilize some of the stuff you've learned. Um, so I'm wondering if there's a site that might want to start with question one and share what their thoughts are on how Kathy might be supported to understand her illness and make plans. And when you do pipe up, could you let us know who you are? Okay, I'll also start calling on some sites if people don't sort of pipe up just so we get a chance to go through and hear from some people. come up. Is there someone willing to answer question one? Okay. Do you mind if I say what you had said too? So we just thought to just sort of asking Kathy um, if she has any questions and see if she can sort of summarize to see what her understanding is of what's going on with her. And then um, also nope. including her doctor to, to maybe go through with her as well and explain it. That's great. Sort of see where her understanding is, right? Um, assuming that, you know, confidence and seeing what she wants to work through before telling her everything all over again. That's great. So anyone else would like to add to question one? Hi, it's Hi. Tara from Central West. Hi, Tara. Thank you. We were just talking. In Central West, there's a tool called Thinking Ahead for individuals with planning around end of life. So I thought that might be something. And we talked a lot about talking with her and you know what's important to her and what she might want to see so and it might i mean we know that she's blind but it would be important to have some things written down so that other people in her life would know what's important to her and sort of what the plans are great thank you great so let's Hi. look a bit at oh go uh, ahead sorry um, sorry we just had one more melanie from Vida. absolutely um, we discussed also if um Kathy was struggling and having difficulty understanding the prognosis, that perhaps there's a way through something that she's interested in, like her theater group, or if through theater she's interested in movies or something like that, that talks about death and dying or care, and someone who she's close to help her relate to things that she's watching or understanding through film and theater back to her own life to help her understand the diagnosis and the prognosis. I think that's a really great answer. That's a really great way of looking creatively of how do we incorporate information in a way that makes sense for somebody. Thank you very much for that. All right, perhaps a site we haven't heard from. Are you, anybody interested in answering question two? A little quiet. Hi. Hi. I'm Melissa. I'm from Craft Support Services. Hi, Melissa. Um, thank you. Um, but I thought... I mean, aside from her boyfriend, um, who I think would be a really great support, but also, I guess, knowing where his understanding is also with her diagnosis and how he can help her. Um, but also asking, like I was also going to say, asking the local theater group to maybe putting together like an audio storybook for her, uh, because she spends a lot of time with these people. She has a lot of trust. so um having them help her like doing like an audio book yeah and then maybe asking questions or having someone support staff ask questions maybe later in the day like um you know you listen to the story what did you think um uh, just questions like that i guess but also the support staff the nurses um she seems pretty active so any neighbor supports um that she has also throughout the community Great. Looking at people that she's got other trusting relationships with to help her sort of navigate this thing is great. Thank you very much for sharing. No problem. Great. Do we have any other sites that might share some ideas of who they think might be valuable to have involved in Kathy's life? Hi, Melanie Reed again. Hi, Melanie. We talked about, other than the boyfriend, we talked about the staff who are supporting and visiting them. Um, for three hours once a day, maybe she spoke with the staff who are visiting and the staff who spent some time supporting her and her boyfriend. Um, we talked about social worker, any number of people on the list, the doctor, if there's any therapist. We also talked about since Kathy is blind, maybe she has a connection with um, any blind 
support service possession might be receiving from any other agency or any other external agency in terms of the support that she's receiving for her blindness. Um, uh, even going to the next question that's included as well, um, does she need more training or different training around her blind support because of her illness? So will those people then be called in to support her for that as well? Um, and then any number of people. We don't know what she has, occupational therapists, social workers, doctors, any people from the list. And then I just had one more thought that we didn't discuss because we didn't have a chance. If her boyfriend has family who supports him, are they friendly and care and also in some way supporting of Kathy? Do they all have a relationship because then her family gets called in as well for support? That's absolutely great. Yeah, and I think it's, you're right, looking at services such as the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, um, when people are going through a lot of different procedures and things that may be involved for um, their illness, um, not being able to see the equipment that's going to be used, um, not being able to sort of see those things and be able to process those um, things is helping them understand those and sort of navigate what that looks like when you don't have the ability to, say for example, see the Ventolin machine or the the, the respiratory support and you can hear it but you can't really process what's going on is really sharing what some of those things are and they might have some resources that way. That's great. Okay. Um, question um, three. There's a site that... Sorry. Was, that's okay. Hi, um, sorry. Yeah. I was just uh, about to add something to question two. Two? Yeah, um, please do. We're here from North Hamilton Community Health Center. Um, another thing that uh, we're not sure if she is uh, religious at all, but I think in the last days offering at least some sort of spiritual guidance and counseling for to get her ready um, for what's to come would be also a, a good idea. She might not be religious, but at least offering that would be a good option. That's great. I think it's really important that to not assume that somebody wouldn't want because they've never had, is always providing people options and opportunities um, that they may not have had before that now seem, you know, to fit with what they want. Right? That's great. Thank you very much for sharing. Okay. I don't know if I get to answer, but um, I have an idea uh, in terms of what would be appropriate for Kathy in her the last three months of her life. Um, I think it'd be really important, at least until as far up to the end as possible for her to stay in an environment that she's familiar with. Um, given her orientation and mobility needs for specifically her blindness, um, she would be oriented to the environment that she's in. So as long as she can be mobile, being in, a, um, in an environment that's familiar to her, that she's been given orientation to, uh, would be most helpful, would limit confusion, um, and it would um, continue her ability to be as mobile as possible until she can no longer. And Just a thought. Sense. Yeah, I think that ties into that what quality of life looks like is the sounds around her and the environment around her she's familiar with. So she wouldn't be necessarily as stressed in an environment that she's familiar with what is going on around her and recognizing that that ding is this and oh, that dog barking is so and so down this hallway and feeling that she's, you know, in a place of familiarity. Thank you. So, do we have any other VC sites before we start um, going through our panelists um, that might know what quality of life would look like for Kathy in the next three months? That didn't come off. Hello, Waypoint here. Hi there, thank you. Um, so our discussion was around being as client-centered as possible and making sure that we ask the questions to help um, determine what Kathy wants to happen in in the final stages, whether she may feel that people go to a hospital to die and may want to go there right away, um, and it would also be determined on what kind of services she's going to need to be comfortable um, in the end. So I think the dialogue needs to continue for the entire th three months. I appreciate with her visual deficits that it makes sense to you and I that she should stay remain in her own environment where she's familiar with things but she may have a completely different concept of death and want those final days to be um, surrounded by people who are caring for her in a medical fashion or she may choose a hospice or she may um, choose to stay at home as as long as possible so um, our discussion was around trying to figure out what the kinds of questions to ask her to find out what is important to her. I think those are great points. Thank you for sharing. 
We have time for just one more um, site if someone wants to add to question three before we go through our panelists. Um, yeah, I was just thinking, like, where where would the boyfriend then come into play? Because we want to make sure that Kathy is supported and, and Kathy feels comfortable with the decisions that she's making. Um, I guess it is kind of a what if. Now, what if boyfriend then turns around and says, you know what, I can't, this isn't something that I'm ready to deal with. So then it's, it's now leaping over that hurdle and saying, you know, okay, now, now we have to kind of deal with two little crises um, in this instance. So yes, we want to keep the dialogue and the conversation with Kathy, but I think involving the, the boyfriend also as much as, as much as we can and as much as they both feel comfortable in sharing uh, all the information. Um, because I think at this point too, it is about Kathy, but it's not just about Kathy. It's also about, I guess, the person that she's going to be leaving behind as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's great. We did talk about that right earlier is who is around them, who in their life is important. And yeah, Mark used the terminology, right? Who are we leaving behind? We have to look at as well. So thank you for sharing. Great. Um, do any of our panelists have anything they want to add before we move on? We heard from Cindy. Uh, Dr. Kelleher, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I, I think the uh, uh, the case uh, does, I think is pur purposely made that the idea of prognosis is really a fluid thing. And uh, um, I think it, it would be rare for, for a patient to be told, okay, you're, in three months you're going to die because there's no way we can know that, that exactly. Uh, but it goes to the point of, you know, when the discussion around prognosis took place, there may have been a lot of discussion. It may have been quite nuanced. It may have been kind of complex. And what did the patient, did the patient just hear three months somewhere in that, you know, barrage of information and latch on to that and really uh, clarifying what the communication has been. And uh, prognoses are usually, you know, was three months thought to be kind of in the middle of a range, was it at the low end of the range, was at the high end of the range, and uh, really trying to, as much as possible to couch it that this isn't written in stone, but it kind of sets the goalposts that helps us to prioritize that we need to be planning for a short amount of time, as well as making sure things are sustainable if indeed uh, the uh, illness trajectory is, is different and we're looking at a longer, uh, a longer process. Um, I think it was specifically vague. If we're talking about lung cancer, that can look very different than something like end-stage pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, uh, with a non-cancer diagnosis that prognoses can have margins of error of months and months and months and that can really make it difficult to uh, 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 to plan. Great, thank you for sharing. Uh, I, 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 I guess the only other thing I, from the physician standpoint that hopefully uh, there could be uh, good reassurance to the patient that uh, uh, in terms of that symptoms can be managed well and trying sort of early on to build that confidence that uh, uh, that, that uh, comfort care is going to be there. Great, thank you. I know we're sort of running a bit in time, so um, Nicole and Jen, I, I assume there'll be lots you can contribute to the next case if that's okay. And uh, I'll move it along to Cindy. Thanks, Tricia, for the introduction and the great case. Really appreciate it. Um, we're going to move on to learning objective number three. And although it does sound like a bit of a lofty learning objective to achieve in the short time frame that we've pro provided for today's um, webinar, I will touch on some of the more um, important um, focus points. And um, you're absolutely uh, able to contact any of the panel at a later date for more details about some of the other things you might want to know about. So I think we'll get started talking about advanced care planning since it kind of comes at the beginning. Um, I've added this quote. Um, it's not an inspirational quote. It's more of a research-based quote um, to say that people, advanced care planning can really have a positive effect on the outcome of life transitions and crises and then for end of life care for people with a developmental disability. This quote comes directly from the Canadian 
consensus guidelines, which is a document that supports best practices in the primary care of adults with developmental disabilities. So with that in mind, I think as we discuss end-of-life care for the people that you're supporting, it will help give you a sense of why it's going to be important and why you need to be thinking about this ahead of a crisis. So what is advanced care planning? We've all heard of this tag, but it's often misunderstood. People generally think that advanced care planning is about whether or not the person wants to have CPR performed on them. And while this is one of the important decisions that needs to be made as a part of the advanced care planning process, there's many other equally important decisions to make. So the beginning stages is to open up a discussion with the person and their family if they're available and that's appropriate, to find out what their fears, values, and wishes are in terms of their health care. In this discussion, it will be important to review with that person their opinions on invasive treatments, CPR certainly being one of them, but there are many others. An advanced care plan also needs to be shared with caregivers wherever possible so that everyone who's working with the individual or who's involved in that person's life can be aware and advocate for their wishes. It generally also involves assigning a substitute decision maker. You want to do that for a time down the road when you can no longer make your wishes known to yourself, or on your own rather. So ideally there'd be documentation of your plan, and the plan should be revisited at very least annually, or whenever there's a health change in the person's health status that may impact the wishes that were already made or potentially require decisions that you hadn't already anticipated. In terms of who needs advanced care planning, it's really, it's particularly important for people with a developmental disability to have an advanced care plan because these discussions generally require a significant amount of time and possibly a multi-pronged approach to communicating all the information that's required so that the person can truly understand the potential consequences of the decisions that they're making, as well as time that may be needed to obtain their decisions. Doing this in advance allows for the best integration of the person's wishes into the plan and can remove emotional decision making that can sometimes happen at a time of crisis when those decisions are left to the person's family or caregivers. So, you know, the slide starts out a tiny bit tongue-in-cheek, but the reality is that every one of us will come to this stage in our lives, and the bottom line basically is that everyone needs an advanced care plan. You know, ideally an advanced care plan would be done when a person is healthy and able to make their own clear decisions. It certainly becomes more necessary when someone is facing a chronic long-term illness, and then even more so when someone's facing the end stages of an advanced illness. Just flip on to the next slide. So, when you would consider an advanced care plan, basically, you know, immediately. Now, it's never too late, never too early. It's not to beat this to death, but it is important to consider this type of planning at a time of wellness. We see many situations where we've left these decisions until a time of crisis comes that requires immediate answers to difficult questions. And not only does that not necessarily give the opportunity for communication, but it can really prevent the person themselves from being involved in these decisions because they can sometimes have come to a point where they no longer can express their own wishes. So, we want to take that opportunity whenever possible. Another couple of important points I thought might be valuable to the folks that are watching this webinar is that not having verbal skills certainly does not prevent you from having the right to express your wishes regarding advanced care planning. With people who have communication difficulties, it will be of the utmost importance to provide alternative means for them to communicate their wishes, as well as to deliver the information to them. 
it's also important to use the capable wishes of an individual before uh, moving on to substitute decision maker. Um, having a substitute decision maker definitely does not mean that a person gives up their rights to make decisions as long as they're capable. And it's really only to be used when they're no longer able to make those decisions on their own. Um, I also think, um, although it's not included on the slide, I think it's an important point to make that a paid caregiver really should not be uh, a substitute decision maker for someone that they're providing paid care for. It, because of how it poses a conflict of interest based on the power differential in the, in the relationship between a paired, paid caregiver and a person that you're supporting. It probably goes without saying, but I, I really think that sometimes people are put in a position where they're expected to do that, and that's really um, not appropriate. There is a hierarchy of um, people who can act as a substitute decision maker um, in these situations um, under the uh, Substitute Decisions Act. Um, so it does identify sort of in order who can make the who can be that person if that person is not available or not willing it goes on to the next person with the uh, public guardian and trustee as the very last resort in that list so there definitely is always someone available to to take on that responsibility Cindy um, I just have a question from a, a viewer on webcast and you're speaking directly to this point, but I'll, I'll read it out. Regarding substitute decision maker, can someone with limited intellectual capacity designate the SDM? And then if not, what are the options which you've been speaking to? Could you just elaborate on that? Um, yeah, there will be a threshold for um, the capacity to consent. And the person receiving that consent is the person that needs to make that determination. Um, it's often a major frustration in this sector because um, where we, um, as I think Tricia mentioned earlier, always want to assume that someone can make decisions for themselves and quite often they can make many of, you know, of the or all of the decisions that they've been faced with up until this point. Um, then they become faced with decisions that they need to make around complex medical issues that are potentially beyond their their cognitive ability to comprehend and understand. Um, a healthcare provider is obligated to ensure that they're obtaining informed consent for the treatment that they're proposing or the plan of care that they're proposing. So if they have any doubt in that person's capacity to consent, then they can enact the um, others in that sort of chain of command. The Substitute Decisions Act um, exists but also so does the Healthcare Consent Act. So it does allow for um, say a physician who has a, a planned treatment plan for an individual to um, go forward in the absence of a substitute decision maker that's officially um, identified to obtain consent or um, you know get decisions on healthcare treatment for a person who maybe doesn't have that that skill level. So if they don't have capacity, um, they can't decide on their own substitute decision maker. Um, if they're already, um, if their decisions are already made by a substitute decision maker, um, that's who those questions fall to again. Um, hopefully Dr. Kelleher can correct me if I've said something wrong. Um, and I'm not entirely certain that I answered the person's questions completely, but there is that hierarchy that can be found in the Substitute Decisions Act. I didn't include it in the slides just because, um, well, frankly, I didn't think anyone would want to, to hear about that, but certainly you can contact me if you would like me to share that link with you. Um, and it does sort of take their way, take your way through the list of people. Um, generally speaking, family is first, you know, starting with the guardian, then uh, following the, that. If someone doesn't have a guardian, then they have been probably assumed at some point to be capable to make those decisions. Um, and they can also then appoint a power of attorney on their own behalf. And if that can't happen, um, the Consent and Capacity Board can appoint someone, and then it generally falls through the family, the, the scheme of family members, such as the spouse and the parent and those kinds of things. So I hope I answered that question, and I, 
I can certainly try my best to provide some further information if that's required. So if we want to go back to the slide deck, I think um, I did want to point out that we will have some resources and tools towards the end um, that won't be in included in the presentation, but are definitely included in the slides. Um, and I want to thank Tara for mentioning the Thinking Ahead booklet. Um, I first saw that at the Community Living of Elmira and District, and it is a truly a fabulous tool in uh, walking through some of those decisions with someone with an intellectual disability. Um, and it's very careful to examine the person from a biopsychosocial approach. So there will be some of those available, and that is a link to that tool is one of them. So um, we're going to move on to talking about some of the physical symptoms of um, in palli involved in palliative care. And there is many of them, um, and I think we're going to only discuss pain management for the purposes of this presentation. We definitely want to give you as much time as possible to discuss um, your details and, and specifics with the esteemed panel members who can provide you with more in-depth information. So um, the first topic we'll hit on is pain assessment. And frankly, I want to say that good quality of life um, for a person suffering at the end of their life truly hinges on adequate pain management. What this does is puts the caregiver in a very important position of continuous assessment of the pain, um, sort of with the um, highlight on the word continuous. Um, when you need to take a, an ongoing assessment of the pain the person's experiencing and provide relief immediately. Um, if what's made available to you in terms of pain relief doesn't appear to be adequate and the person's not um, having good pain control on an ongoing basis, then this is your opportunity to advocate and work with the physician who's um, managing the care of the person you're supporting to ensure that they do get the best pain management and that those orders are changed wherever it's appropriate. Um, this is where communication between the family members, the care team, the palliative care team, you know, the, the frontline staff team, that's going to be incredibly important in order to maintain a good quality of life for the person you're supporting. So I want to throw out the concept of total pain um, because really an important factor in effectively managing pain for a person um, and providing optimal comfort, minimizing suffering, um, is to examine pain from all sources um, as the person and, and provide relief on all levels. Um, pe people experience suffering from each of those their domains as their life is coming to an end and they require support to manage each of them. I don't know if you can really see them because they, they really turned out a little bit smaller than I thought they would. Um, but just to kind of tell you what they are in case you can't see them, it's social pain, physical pain, spiritual pain, and emotional pain. And really only once you've, con man you've considered total pain have you really done all you can do to minimize the suffering in the dying person. Um, as a caregiver, it's extremely important to examine the different domains um, for that person to understand what's important to them, as Trisha talked about earlier, and how to support them through losses of identity or connection. Um, just to maybe give you a, a quick example, if you were supporting someone who spent their last 10 years working in the canteen at uh, your community living association, they identify themselves as a person through that role, their role as an employee, and the connections that they make with their colleagues and their, their customers. Um, if their illness pre prevents them from continuing to fulfill that role, this will be a significant loss of their sense of self and their well-being and sense of belonging in the community. So you need to develop strategies and put those in place to help that person make their way through that loss. Um, very similar to some of the things Trisha suggested. You know, talk, think about how you can maintain those connections. Um, you know, if there's opportunity for them to visit the workplace, those kinds of things. Um, just if you take the time to examine all of those different aspects of a person, you will find the things that are important to them and that they're going to see as a loss that will cause them um, upset and um, contribute to their suffering towards the end of their life. So anything that you can do to support that process is going to be helpful. I want to move on to the next slide. Um, clearly, most caregivers um, and healthcare providers 
in general, generally speaking, rely on a person's self-report for assessing pain. Um, sometimes this method's not available when working with a person with a developmental disability. Often, even those folks who seem to have very good communication skills can often have some difficulty in effectively expressing um, or describing their pain symptoms. Um, this can really quite often result in under treatment and unnecessary suffering for the person. So knowing this makes it very important to rely on the people that have uh, meaningful relationships with that person to get the most accurate assessment of the subtle communications or behavior changes that might indicate pain. I do want to say though that you need to be cautious to remain objective during this process and avoid applying your personal feelings and beliefs to that assessment. Um, using concrete tools uh, will assist with that objectivity. I have um, also added a slide of, of tools that might be helpful when working with people who are struggling to express themselves verbally. And those are on the next slide actually. Um, so these are just a few. There is, there is many, um, and some of you may have seen the more popular one, which is the, the FACES, pain rating scale. Um, so you want to take time to carefully and thoroughly assess for pain. It would be my suggestion that you would absolutely use more than one. Um, that one tool by itself may not fit the situation um, and it may not look at the person from all, all angles. Um, so I would say use multiple tools and definitely, as I said before, assess repeatedly. Um, it needs to be an ongoing part of the plan of care to make sure that you're always staying ahead of that. Um, I also like to say, um, you know, I think in the developmental service sector, we often try to steer clear of medication wherever possible, which definitely comes from a place of, um, of kindness because we've seen people medicated needlessly um, in the work that we've done. But when it comes to palliative care, we, um, medication, uh, and pain management are really so very important that you need to make sure that you're not hesitant with the pain management. Um, you, you, when you assess, if you're getting any signs that the person's pain management is not effective, you definitely need to speak to the doctor to get that changed. Um, pain management is one of the greatest contributors to a peaceful death, I think, overall. And I Hi. think links to, sorry. Hi, it's Marie Hi. at Community Living and we're asking at the thing. I have a question. I have a gentleman in the hospital right now. He's dying of cancer. He's in severe pain. Um, I've been there with him for the last week and a half to two weeks. And the problem I'm having right now, I respect what he's saying, is sometimes he's refusing his pain meds. How do we, do we let him just continue refusing or what would you recommend? Is there a way? that we can help Hi. Him. Hi, this is Roseanne. I'm just going to interrupt. <clears throat> hi, Roseanne. Um, hi. Hi to the lady in Sturgeon Falls. And thank you for your question. We're, in order to get through the rest of the content, we're asking that people hold questions to the end. Okay. okay. No problem. So thank you. Just hang on. <laughs> okay. uh, we'd like to be able to get through content and then a case study. And who knows, you might even get the answer before the end. <laughs> okay, but thank we'll, you so we'll much. We'll get back. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, thanks for your question, though. I do appreciate and I understand that there are difficult situations going on on an ongoing basis all across the province, I'm sure much beyond the province. Um, and hopefully, um, Dr. Kelleher or someone else from the panel may be actually best equipped to answer that question. Um, so I'll continue on then with the, with the slide deck in hopes that we give you some more information. Um, I want to also talk about um, comfort measures, practically and otherwise. But I want the first thing I want to say is that uh, pain management for a terminal illness really should never be PRN only. Certainly, you want to have PRN medications uh, as an adjunct to the primary um, treatment plan, um, but um, ongoing assessment of the pain experience really should guide treatment and dosing changes to minimize the need for that breakthrough kind of pain relief um, pro by providing a regular dose of medication that really meets that person's needs. 
So it just kind of goes back to say again why um, ongoing assessment is really important and ongoing communication with your physician. Um, you know, pain equals suffering. Uh, basically, the number one job in palliative care is to minimize suffering. Um, in community settings, you want to maintain a close relationship with the palliative care professionals and utilize their services fully. If you're finding yourself in a situation late at night where the person is suffering, um, the care access teams, generally speaking, have 24-hour on-call response. Definitely access that um, and incorporate all aspects of the person's comfort into the end of the end of their end of life care. So as we said previously, and as Trisha talked about, we want to examine their comfort from all the different domains. So spirituality, their environment, their personal belongings, so those things that are near and dear to them, and then of course their friends and family. So in terms of specifically when working with people with a developmental disability, you need to be concrete about taking steps to minimize fear and anxiety at the end of life. So we've kind of handled pain. Um, fear and anxiety are, are equally as important in supporting someone at the end of their life. Um, all of this, uh, all of the, the entire situation can truly be quite confusing to a person. Um, and you need to be sure that you give them adequate information in simple terms to help them understand what's happening and what they can expect to happen next. So you want to always ensure you provide those practical comfort measures we talked about, but you want to be also certain to give physical signs of caring, such as a simple appropriate touch and surround them with items that are familiar to them and comforting. Um, also provide them with, with assurances wherever possible. You want to make sure that they know that someone will be with them, um, that they're not alone and that they are cared for give them the opportunity to share their feelings and anxieties as well. So I think we'll sort of leave pain and head into grief. Um, again, I wanted to make note that we are just sort of touching on the surface of some of these topics um, in order to make sure that we give you as much information as possible in a short time. Um, but I really loved this quote um, you know, because grief is truly an integral part of the death experience, both for the person who is dying and for the people that support them. So to we the quote being, to weep is to make less the death of grief. Very beautiful. So um, grief is a multifaceted response to a significant loss. Um, it's typically in relation to a loss of someone or something um, that has died that the person has deformed um, a deep bond or a deep affection for. Um, grief can be displayed in so many ways. Everyone's experience is a little bit different and certainly everyone expresses their grief in different ways. So all, you know, all of those opportunities to um, assess the person, you need to be doing that in terms of grief support as well. So from a psychological perspective, behavioral, social, and of course there are physical reactions as well to grief. Um, and grief is experienced generally as um, deep mental anguish. So we now understand that people with developmental disabilities respond to bereavement in basically the same way that everyone else does. Um, historically, that has not been the belief. Uh, historically, it was thought that perhaps people with developmental disabilities didn't experience um, grief at all, um, which is completely incorrect and certainly not the way we want to, to be thinking going forward. Um, distress symptoms such as depression or anxiety can certainly be prolonged with the person with developmental disability. Sometimes it has to do with um, their level of coping skills. Sometimes it has to do with um, what kind of ability they've been given to uh, express their grief and work their way through it. But it certainly can be it can present differently, but it, they feel it the same way. So you need to give opportunities for the person to express um, their grief. And for the people who are nonverbal, um, it's going to be equally as important to provide sort of some kind of creative avenue for them to express their grief, such as painting, dance, uh, sometimes creating a photo album of the person, or you know, if they're dealing with someone 
uh, facing death, uh, facing their own death, uh, creating a photo album of people they love, of experiences they've had, can be very helpful in them making their way through that. And similarly, for someone who's experiencing the death of a person that they care for, um, you know, helping them to remember the positive times so that the the uh, the difficult times that are experienced during palliative care are not the lasting images in their mind. So, you know, there is absolutely no evidence to suggest that people with a developmental disability need less information about um, illness, death, and dying. Um, it just needs to be provided in a way that meets their communication and comprehension abilities. Um, so if you get if you take that into consideration, you can help someone make their way through grief quite, um, you know, in quite a in, a in a way that can have quite a positive effect on them. I also want to talk about this term um, disenfranchised grief. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone has heard of this t this um, this topic, but it is frankly quite common amongst um, people with developmental disabilities. Carers are often unsure uh, if they should talk to the person with a developmental disability about their illness or the illness of another person. Um, so there's some common misconceptions about grief, as I mentioned previously, that people with a disability don't understand or they can't comprehend. Um, people with disabilities don't show grief, therefore they don't experience grief. Talking about it would be too upsetting or too painful for him. Um, with these kinds of, th of thoughts and this kind of underlying uh, rationale for your behavior around helping someone manage their grief, um, it really poses a danger of creating what's called a conspiracy of silence, where um, family, friends, caregivers, professionals all know about the illness and the impending death of either the person or someone they love very, very much, but they won't talk about it in the presence of that person. Um, they use arguments such as he won't understand or the truth is going to be too upsetting. Um, quite clearly, that's, that's not true. Um, and the unintended consequence of, of this action is generally an increase in the person's anxiety through confusion. And it certainly will not support um, a peaceful death if, they're, if you're dealing with the person who's dying themselves. And it certainly can't assist with grief and closure for someone who's experiencing the death of a loved one. So, In terms of strategies to use um, in order to avoid that conspiracy of silence would certainly be to provide accurate and honest information. Take consideration for what the person is able to comprehend and look to find ways to um, make the information that you're providing relevant to their understanding. So putting a process in place to support that, that information. There is a lot of plain language uh, tools available um, if, uh, you know, based on the situation that you're facing. Uh, the United Kingdom is very advanced in terms of their the plain language tools that they have available. Um, certainly, um, as I mentioned, my contact information is at the end. If you're ever faced with a situation that you're looking for some of that kind of information for, there's people who can find that information for you. Um, you definitely want to provide opportunities for the expression of grief and condolences. So like we talked about earlier, um, picture books, um, any number of opportunities to express, you know, visiting the person going to places where they once uh, had a good time, sort of just revisiting the positive aspects of their life. And you definitely want to provide assurances. So uh, provide reassurance that there's no blame, um, that what's going on is not the fault of anyone, and help them understand how things will be different going forward. Some more um, strategies on the next slide. You want to promote conversations about the loved one. We want it to not be something sort of quiet and silent that we sweep under the rug. We want to be able to talk about the loved one in a way that honors their, their lost life and remember the feelings that were shared between them and take the opportunity to think about the person um, and what that person might have wanted for um, his friends and family as they move on with their lives. And provide opportunities for the person to make connections to the past, present, and future. I think I touched on that in the last slide. <clears throat> looking at pictures, making a memory book, 
um, giving, you know, potentially depending on um, on what's available and the permissions afforded by the people who get to decide, you know, to be able to give someone who is close to that person something that belonged to them in order to help them remember them, lighting a candle, and as I said earlier, visiting places they once went together. Um, but you also want to be sure to consider not only the person that you're supporting um, when looking at these kinds of strategies, but also the family members, the other clients um, that are a part of the person's life. And staff also require support. Um, there's many situations where staff have worked directly with that individual for many, many years and have built uh, a strong bond as well. Um, their involvement in memorial services, uh, perhaps creating a memory book and grief counseling that is often offered by e individual organizations, um, EAP programs, can be valuable tools to help them manage their grief so that they can maintain their support role with the other uh, grievers that they're supporting. So just not just a, a note not to forget about those folks as well. So we're going to move on to the next case. Um, keeping in mind all of the things that we've learned from the very beginning, um, we're going to talk about Brent. So um, Brent moved into an institution. Um, sorry, we're going to set it up pretty much exactly the way we did with Kathy. I'll read the information. Um, it is available on your slides for you to refer to. I'll ask you some questions. You'll get the opportunity to discuss it amongst those who are at your site. And then we'll take um, some answers to the questions from the various sites. I encourage you to speak up so that you can potentially get as much information as possible out of this case. So um, Brent moved into the institution when he was just a toddler and he had a diagnosis of cerebral palsy and a profound developmental disability. He also suffered from reflux, epilepsy and chronic lung infections. Uh, Brent had no language skills, um, although you could easily see when he was happy or upset by the expressions on his face and the sounds that he made. He also had no independent mobility. He relied fully on uh, supported personal care and he used a G-tube for nutritional support. Brent had a lifelong history of respiratory infections and received daily treatments to support that respiratory health, even when he was well in his home, as well as um, having gone to for many hospital admissions for pneumonia that could not be treated at home or then required IV antibiotics. Uh, Brent moved into the group home in the community in, the, at 2000, in 2003. His mother began to visit a couple times a year. She hadn't visited um, while he lived in the institution and he now saw his brother also every couple of years. This was a connection that brought him tremendous joy. Uh, Brent had three housemates. They lived together for eight years. And a couple of them he'd also spent, uh, lived closely with when he lived in the institution as well. Brent loved Elvis and he loved watching game shows whenever he had the chance. Um, the theme songs to game shows created a, a great a deal of joy. And he also had a love of animals and he responded um, quite positively to animals really of any kind. Brent was experiencing um, some respiratory difficulties. Uh, the staff sort of kicked into gear with what they typically do in this situation, but he wasn't improving as he normally does. So they took Brent to the local hospital for further assessment. He ended up getting admitted and stayed in the hospital for several weeks, um, but, but he wasn't responding to the treatment being given, given to him there. He was having difficulty sleeping in the hospital setting and most of his specialized equipment was not available to him which limited his ability to get around and to interact with others. He had none of his personal comforts of home. Brent was deemed palliative um, at, after a few weeks in hospital and sent home to be in his own environment. So the questions I want you to consider amongst yourselves would be, firstly, when does pal palliative care begin for Brent? Two, who is grieving? Three, what are some of the ways to help those that are grieving? And four, what needs to be considered in providing good end of life care for Brent? And I'll just give you about two or three minutes to talk amongst yourselves and I'll come back to um, receive some feedback from the group. I have 11.55 right now. 11.58, we'll turn the mic back on. 
Yeah, thanks, Cindy. That's perfect timing. Um, certainly for this session, we uh, allotted two and a half hours, and uh, you never know exactly how long it's going to go. So we have plenty of time, and do take your time to analyze the case. We'll be back in a couple of moments. Okay, so I know those were sort of big questions for you to contemplate in the span of two minutes, but I definitely want to give you the opportunity to talk to someone other than me um, before we end our presentation today. So um, if I could ask for someone to maybe um, throw out their impression of what uh, the answer to question one is, when does palliative care begin for Brent? Um, can, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. So um, I think that palliative care should have started or should start at the moment of the diagnosis, um, not when so many years ago. Uh, it's about achieving quality of life throughout, throughout the life until the end of his days and not only when he's uh, very, very sick. Uh, I guess that's, that's my opinion. So anything, any comfort measures, uh, that could have have been taken since he was a young boy to give him quality of life with the disease that he has um, is, I guess, my opinion. Wow, that's really amazing. I won't even have to ask anybody else to answer <laughs> because that's really a great answer and frankly hits the nail on the head in terms of how to answer this question. Um, with keeping in mind what you've said, um, I just want to add a couple of points that I um, ran down for myself. Knowing that Brent suffers from a life-limiting illness or a serious illness compounded by his profound developmental disability and physical disability, palliative care is going to be lifelong in nature for this young man. Um, it's, uh, palliative care focuses on the person, not on the disease, and applies a holistic approach to meeting the physical, practical, functional, social, emotional and spiritual needs of the person and the cares facing a progressive illness and bereavement. So yes, absolutely begins at the beginning. Um, as soon as you know that you have a condition that's going to alter the course of your life. Um, so that's great. Thank you so much for that input. Um, I'll move on to the second question, which is who is grieving? Um, so if I could throw that out to someone else, that would be great. Not 
Asher. Hello. You? Hi. Um, in 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 regards to grieving, um, I would say that a lot of the uh, support staff and people that have worked with Brent are going to be the ones grieving. Um, not, I mean, just reading the case study, I don't know Brent very well. I don't know where he would be at with grieving, if he even understands um, his diagnosis, considering he's been living with a lot of pneumonia infections uh, since toddler. Like, this could be something that's totally, like, he thinks is totally normal um, for him. But definitely, even the family, uh, I'm not too sure what kind of happened while family would not visit while he was in uh, institution. I don't know if it was just a travel thing or what have you, but then having <clears throat> them re-enter his life, um, I can see that be a center of grief for Brent, just having his family come back into his life and then bam, you know, he's dealing with, okay, well now I only have X amount of time. and um, So I can see that being stress and a, and a major amount of grief for Brent in that aspect. Thank you. That's great. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, in terms of, you know, we often think family of family first. Um, it's important to think about those other people in the person's life. And and I'm I know that I didn't give you maybe enough detail in the case to know who all of those people might be. But you can certainly think of staff, people that he lives with, people that he lived with in the institution, basically all of his friends in his life. And I and I do want to maybe say um, in response to your. Um, your question about the family not being involved in his life, that sometimes is an initial resentment on the part of um, the paid caregivers when family has been absent from the person's life for a very, very long time, and then they, they come back into their life um, at these integral points um, of need, and sometimes that's a really hard thing for people to reconcile. But um, you know, I think it's important to understand what uh, the family of a person who was diagnosed with this kind of a uh, disability and illnesses nearing 30 years ago, what kind of decisions that they're facing in their life, and to really kind of put that behind you and try and remember that it's going to be about the person and as much as you can involve their family in the situation as possible is going to benefit not only this person themselves, but sometimes people face a lot of guilt over the decisions they've made, um, you know, decisions they made 30 years ago that they wouldn't make again today based on what they now know, how things have changed um, in the sector at itself. Um, and even sometimes when someone has the kind of care needs that Brent seemingly had when he was very, very young, um, they're often told things like, your, your son won't live past a year or two years old, you need to make some of these decisions for the and, and move on with your life. So there's um, kind of hindsight is 2020, um, but we all uh, the family is going to be an important part of the person's life. Sort of whether they've been involved or they haven't, it's going to always be an important aspect of uh, of that person's grief planning, advanced care planning, palliative care planning in whatever way they're they're willing to be part of that. So I really thank you for your answer. So um, maybe if we can talk, if there's one person that wants to answer the third question, what are some ways to help those that are grieving? Okay, I think maybe I'll just answer that one because I think the last point is probably the biggest point. Um, so in terms of um, helping grievers in this situation, we want to ensure that bereavement support mm -hmm. is available um, to these people by making them aware of the impending death. So making sure everyone does know so that they can take um, whatever steps they choose to take in terms of visiting um, and helping people that may have difficulty with the concept of death and dying. Um, to understand using plain languages, plain language tools rather, and other methods as appropriate. Um, so, From one of all, I'd like to add something. Please. So just that we have a lot of uh, younger employees who haven't had to face death in their own life, 
and we have a, one of our homes where we have had some palliative situations where these employees are working. We found the palliative care team from the Briere Hospital in our case was very helpful in coming in to speak to the staff about what to expect, what's it going to look like, what can you see when someone is preparing to die, they're going to be not eating as much, they're not going to, they're going to be sleeping more, etc. We found that really helpful for the staff to be, I guess, reassured and just aware of what to expect. Yes, you're absolutely right. Certainly knowledge is power in terms of being able to support someone to the best of your ability. Um, often, um, you know, looking historically, these deaths have been a surprise and we haven't handled them in a way that's in keeping with um, the palliative approach. And really, if we can take more of a palliative approach along the whole trajectory of the person's life, um, we can provide them with better end-of-life care um, by understanding some of those things. Um, I know a lot of the question that kind of comes at the very beginning is, you know, what's going on? Why is this happening? Um, you know, what should I be on the lookout for? And certainly that's not the skill set typically of frontline staff, um, paid carers in a, in a developmental service organization. Their um, job has been about um, achieving things and making goals and setting plans and uh, being having ha having an active role in the community and those kinds of things and now they really have to take a full 360 but really take the aspect of person-centered planning that they've always used and apply it in a different in a different way to a different um, life experience but quite possibly one that they've never been involved in before so it, it can be very stressful um, People will, can often second-guess themselves, so absolutely your palliative care team is going to be um, you know, really a valuable resource in terms of training um, and in terms of putting people at ease with what's going to go on. Um, things like um, you might catch, catch yourself in a situation where someone's nearing the end of their life and everyone does know that, but people will still take their vital signs every half an hour. And it will be distressing to the staff team that are, you know, as they're watching these numbers um, say things to them that they want to take action on. So knowing that that's not really a, a good practical tool to take someone's O2 sats as they're nearing the end of their life um, to ha sort of gain that understanding about what's going, what you can expect to go on, so that it's not going to um, cause anxiety amongst the team. So I appreciate that answer. Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's Kathy from the Freeport site at Grand River in Kitchener. Um, I really appreci appreciate um, the, the points that you just made. Those are excellent. Um, the only thing that I'd like to add is uh, really encouraging um, seeing the person as they're nearing their death, um, encouraging everyone around them to celebrate their life and bring it from that perspective. Um, you know, we see it in the papers, in the obituaries, you know, we're going to have a celebration of this person's life, and that really seems like it would fit with that, with our population. That's a great point. You absolutely make, um, funerals can be very um, melancholy. So, yeah, you definitely want to have that opportunity to um, laugh and put up the funny pictures and share funny stories and heartfelt um, interactions with other people who care about the individual themselves. It's a very, very important um, part of the process. Thank you for that. So I think we'll move on to the final question, which is what needs to be considered in providing good end-of-life care for Brent? And I do think we've touched on a lot of it already. Um, so if anybody has any, idea, any ideas that haven't kind of been expressed already, please feel free to throw them out. And then I'm going to turn all of this over to um, some of the other folks in the, in the panel. It will, instead of maybe farming out to try and pick on someone, I will just kind of uh, end my portion of the case study with sort of letting you know kind of what it would have looked like if you were considering everything. Um, you know, the person was brought home from the hospital, of course, with the support of the palliative care team and the local community care access center. 
They were provided with a pump so that they could get good pain management. Um, they can also be provided with 24-hour one-on-one care um, by the agency so that they can always have someone with them at the time uh, at their time of death. Um, the mother and brother be invited to be at their side. Um, they were provided um, a place to stay, uh, a place to sleep so that they could remain near the person at all times. Um, Elvis playing in the background at all hours would be very soothing, as well as making sure that they had some of their own personal comfort items, uh, the things that they loved nearby. Um, you know, having done this, the family ends up being grateful for um, the peaceful environment that they're able to celebrate their loved one's death with. Um, and they're able to then make peace with some of their decisions and some of their actions over the years, um, seeing how well cared for the person can be. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say. Um, I think everybody touched on all the other points. The last thing I wanted to make mention of, and there is a beautiful quote at the very end that, of course, we should definitely show to the group, but there is three slides of resources. So there's advanced care planning resources that we mentioned earlier. There's um, a link, links to all of those um, pain resources, and then there's some grief resources, all specific to people with either intellectual disabilities or for people who are perhaps nonverbal, depending on what the topic was. But that uh, final quote was um, from Dame Cecily Saunders, and I'm sorry I have pushed uh, Roseanne past it now, but you matter because you are you, and you matter to the end of your life. We will do, we will do all we can, not only to help you die peacefully, but also to live until you die. And that's just really quite beautiful, and it really epitomizes the type of care that uh, we want to provide to everyone in, in this uh, sector, and certainly to everyone experiencing um, palliative uh, care at the end, towards the end of their life. So I will turn everything over to the rest of the panel now, because you've all heard plenty from me. Hi, this is Roseanne. Thanks so much, Cindy. I just wanted to ask the panelists now to weigh in on this case. Uh, Dr. Kelleher, do you have something to add? Um, number four, certainly go to end of life care for Brent. Can you add something if you do have comment and uh, we can move to Jen or Nicole or Marg. Please take the floor. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a pretty rich case. I think you could probably spend the whole two and a half hours uh, uh, diverging to all the different issues that the case brings up. Um, going from, I, I guess going back just a little bit to sort of the question about uh, sort of choosing a substitute decision maker, I think that question was more around uh, designating a power of attorney and uh, um, certainly when there's a substitute that's already in place, whether it's a court appointed, I think in this case, then that's going to be, that's going to stand. And uh, in terms of someone uh, choosing a different substitute decision maker, certainly that would encompass some kind of uh, assessment of capacity. And for, for power of attorney, to my knowledge, there aren't any uh, really uh, uh, explicit criteria for that so it, it really comes back to the person about uh, involved in that process whether it's a social worker whether it's an attorney whether it's a, a health care team um, and I think this case sort of implicit in this case is that there there were discussions either before the hospitalization or during uh, to say that you know the hospital uh, the hospital based interventions are no longer in line with the goals of care and so and hence the return home um, I think this uh, thinking about this case uh, with someone who's getting artificial feeds that's a whole other topic of, of conversation in terms of uh, the discussions and the evaluations that go into uh, uh, evaluating whether ongoing artificial feeds are uh, of medical benefit. Uh, and if they're not, then they're stopped. Uh, and uh, how that, that not only impacts the, 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 the patient, but uh, certainly the caregivers around, around them need to be sort of engaged in that, in that discussion and that decision making um, so, that they're, so that it's uh, clear why the decisions are being made uh, and so that everyone can be uh, comfortable with uh, changes uh, in, in that respect. Um, going back to the idea of 
uh, of pain management, I think the uh, in this case illustrates one where where pain may not be a, a major factor for uh, for this particular patient, but we may be dealing more with shortness of breath, more with coughing, um, and so it's really that uh, holistic assessment and. Uh, 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 focusing on multiple symptoms uh, and not necessarily assuming uh, 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 a symptom and uh, going down the wrong path, but having that, uh, as was said, that ongoing assessment that if a treatment doesn't seem to be working or is making things worse, are the side effects outweighing the benefits? Are we misinterpreting the symptoms? Uh, that's going to be important. And. Uh, and also, I think the education piece for the caregivers about, you know, what does, I, what I'm taking away from this is this is sort of an end stage respiratory failure situation. What does that look like? What are normal changes that are going to occur? Uh, differentiating uh, shortness of breath as a symptom from the normal signs that we would see in terms of changes in breathing patterns and, and educating that sort of uh, what might look like increased work of breathing does not necessarily uh, co correlate with with suffering or with with shortness of breath, and so uh, trying to get into some of that uh, uh, nuance, and that's obviously where uh, your expert, hopefully expert palliative nurses, are going to be helpful in assessing those symptoms and and uh, and helping to guide the uh, the caregivers that are you know really at the bedside uh, for most of the time. All right, thanks, Dr. Kelleher. Is there another panelist who'd like to make comment on this case? All right, I think we'd like to weigh in if, if we had a chance. Um, Great. I think, first of all, to for quality care for Brent, we really want to maximize and maintain um, his participation in things that bring him joy. And I know we talked about this before, and I think they did a good job with this case in terms of the music and maybe therapeutic animals, um, making sure he's comfortable and that uh, that he's surrounded by the things that he loves, I think is really important. And also something just personally, I think going through this in some of our, our care is um, and really important to educate the staff, but also to maintain that communication and education with the clients that live in the home. And a lot of our, our residences, People may not, Brent not, may not live uh, in a, a single bedroom. So being able to know to the clients in the homes that, you know, more people are going to be coming into your home. This is what it means. This is what it means for Brent. And how can we celebrate his life? I think that's important um, to maintain that pulse of the home and how the home feels for everybody that lives there. And I think that only adds to the quality of life for Brent's care, uh, that the people in his life feel comfortable to deal with his transition as well. Yeah. And from a physiotherapy perspective, um, you know, Brent already has a lot of specialized equipment, but I think just in terms of educating uh, his team that he's going to be more at risk for skin breakdown, so he may need, you know, more advanced um, uh, specialized mattress and, and, you know, more frequent repositioning than he, than he has in previous um, months or years. Um, Again, physio might be involved with his respiratory issues in terms of chest physio um, and teaching the caregivers how to, to help him with his breathing. Um, and again, with pain relief, if he, if he is experiencing pain relief, there may be some comfort measures we can do in terms of massage or um, some of those sensory yeah. things again, uh, like rocking or um, the bath. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's it for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, ladies. And Marg or Tricia, do you have something to add before we open up to general questions? Uh, Marg just had to step out quick, but no, I think I think everybody touched on it. I think it's been a really great feedback for that that case today. Now that everyone's sort of got everything under the belt, and I think people have some really fantastic ideas. So good case today, Cindy, and good stuff, everybody. Excellent, great participation from the sites and from the panelists. Thank you. Um, so let's open up to questions. We have just under, we just have about 10 minutes. Um, before I open the floor to questions, I want to thank all the panelists for their work on this uh, wonderful session. And I also want to remind participants, because we still have many in their rooms, to please take out your smart devices, all your technology. We encourage it. <laughs> 
and we'd like you to please access the questionnaire, the online questionnaire. Please give us your feedback on this, uh, this event today. All right, thank you. And let's open up to questions. I know that uh, the lady in Sturgeon Falls asked a, question asked a question earlier. You may have your response, but if not, please feel free to unmute. And we're taking questions of a general nature on this topic. Hi, it's Marie your again. Microphone. Oh, hi. Go ahead. Hi. Okay. My question was, um, I'm looking after a gentleman right now that is in end-stage cancer. I've been looking after him for about two and a half weeks, and he's in a lot, a lot of pain. They come in to give him his pain meds, and he refuses repeatedly. Like, it's no, no, no. What do we do? Do we just let him continue, or what's an easier way to make him more comfortable? I can't hear you. No. So uh, can one of the panelists um, take that and answer in a general nature? Of course, this isn't a consult that we're doing on video conference. Yeah, no, I understand that. You're getting information yeah. on pain yes. management. So yes, I understand that. Can one of the panelists open up? Yeah, I guess uh, kind of looking at the broader uh, concept to consider is sort of what, what are the goals of care in this scenario? What is, what is the patient's perception of uh, his or her uh, illness, and you, you kind of need that that overall okay. concept uh, to begin exploring why someone would be refusing medication. Is it uh, is it a misunderstanding as to what the ro what the role of the of the medication is? Is the person afraid that this is going to uh, kill them faster? Is are they afraid of the side effects? Are they just, they just don't like how the hydromorphone stings in the sub-Q port. It, uh, it, it uh, has to be a, a kind of, it has to be a holistic uh, assessment and um, looking at, uh, uh, and I think starting from that, then the answers about, you know, is, uh, will come out as to is the patient capable to, uh, to accept or, or refuse the care, the particular treatment, uh, and if they're not, you know, who would be who would be the substitute? Um, okay. Yeah. But okay. but e even if they're not capable, trying to get a sense of of their wishes, of their what's important to them, and trying to uh, uh, customize the the care. Maybe the pain can be managed in a different way that is acceptable. Um, uh, maybe there are other symptoms that are being uh, because the pain is so prevalent. Are there other symptoms that are are perhaps just as important for the patient that that aren't being addressed. Those are those are my initial thoughts to that question. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Uh, any other questions? I know there's still quite a few people in their rooms. Hi there, it's Waypoint. Go ahead. Waypoint. Oh, at, uh, at the um, beginning of the presentation, Marg identified the palliative approach assessment, which is absolutely wonderful for a situation that we're involved in right now. We were wondering if there is a more medically oriented um, assessment that we might be able to share with our physicians. Again, Mark hasn't returned to the room yet, so I apologize, but um, I do know there are some in Distance. I don't know what age are there, but Dr. Kelleher, do you have um, any references in particular you might know off the top of your head? Otherwise, I can have Mark send those out later. Yeah, I, I so I wasn't sure if this was more around tools for assessing symptoms or uh, what the initial reference to was in terms of what was referenced from the presentation. Oh, okay. um, what was well, referenced from the <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, um, I guess in terms of assessing the patient, in terms of uh, like prognosis, what uh, specifically? More determination of uh, the palliative diagnosis when there isn't a diagnosis like cancer or anything obvious like that. Yeah, I, I, I think the, the approach assessment that has come out is, is meant to be uh, not diagnosis specific because uh, it's meant to hopefully encourage the 
uh, uh, consideration of a palliative approach to care across many different diagnoses and illnesses. And I think that the surprise question is certainly certainly a good one. Um, and and that it it's it's really in some ways it's a case by case basis. Um, certainly uh, in, in the UK there's the the gold standards framework that uh, does comment on a few uh, on on common diagnoses in terms of uh, uh, non-cancer illnesses that can give you a few more ideas about the uh, uh, situations in those diagnoses when when a palliative pr pr approach may be may be more appropriate thank you Hi. Hello? Hi, we can Hello? hear you. Oh, good, sorry. Um, there is, um, in, uh, it, it was um, put out um, partially by St. Joseph's Healthcare in London, an excellent manual that kind of gives um, guidance and understanding through the changes as someone moves towards um, dying. And uh, I don't have it right here with me, but I do have a copy of it. Uh, it's. It, I'm not sure if there's other ones out there, but it's quite good at just giving an understanding and some expectations and how to deal with the different things that happen um, as the person moves toward dying. Um, I can find the information for that. There may be an online version now. I know the one I've got is probably several years old, um, but it's really um, very helpful and um, well, I hate to say easy to follow, but it is somewhat easy to follow. Well, if you do find that, you could send it to Roseanne Stein. My uh, email address is on the flyer that came with this session. Um, so you could send it to me, and whoever's looking for it could email me and ask for that particular document. We have just a couple of minutes left if somebody has a brief question. And, uh, I have a question. Can end okay, go ahead. Uh, my question is actually around the substitute decision maker and... Your conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. I'm just wondering, um, when is a person deemed incapable and who, who and how does that happen and when a substitute decision maker is in play? Um, what can they um, decide, what can they not decide in regards to end-of-life care um, for the person accessing services? Okay, that might take more than two minutes. I was going to say, can I pause it? <laughs> I know it's a but, thing, but um, if you go online to the Ontario government website, there's a whole bunch of information around the Health Care Decision Act, power of attorney, the paperwork to fill it out, a great set of resources on the government website for those uh, all of those very much questions. Thank you. Yeah. Well, and just just one. Did... Oh, one second. Uh, I think Dr. Keller is there. You get the last word, I think. I, well, I think the, the short answer is that capacity uh, really depends on the decision that's being made, uh, and it's not a it's not a catch-all that someone is uh, absolutely capable or absolutely incapable. It depends on the decision, and and I think it does raise a good point that. Uh, whoever is the substitute, substitute decision maker needs education about their role, that they are to express the patient's wishes as they understand them and that it's not uh, that this person can, uh, can come in and decide based on what they think necessarily. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. We just under the wire. I'll wish everybody a wonderful afternoon and please fill out the survey uh, questionnaire online. Please go to your technology and tell us what you thought of the session. Thank you to all of the panelists and this will be our call. Your conference is now over. Goodbye. Everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye Tricia.